so it's you have to be aware of the of the macroeconomic things and just a couple of them. It's not too complicated, but you have to be aware of what's happening, how it affects you, because we do vote. And if you start, they don't want an ed, at least a lot of the politicians don't want an educated populace in that kind of way, because then you could really make informed decisions and you and things would matter more as opposed to promises that most. Well, and the ignorant can't keep. ignorant are more persuadable. Yeah, well, because they believe whatever's told, what is said, right. Welcome to Under the Knife, the podcast where we cut into topics such as politics, life advice, and medicine, and we do this with the precision of a licensed orthopedic surgeon. I'm your host, Dr. Craig Green, an orthopedic surgeon and elected public official. Under the Knife with Dr. Brett Casey. How's it going? Welcome. Welcome. So first thing I want to tell you, you astutely recognized that I think we were playing Band and Dunes Golf. And we were sitting on a bench, the ocean's behind us, and we realized we have the exact same four degrees. We do. Yeah. <laughs> now, you were a year, behead, a year ahead, you're behind. Yeah, I beat you in all of them except one, but, uh, <laughs> but you finished up ahead of me, so I was still in school longer than you. So, <laughs> Well, we're always learning, and speaking of, uh, I'm excited for our guest today because I think you probably are one of the most intelligent people I've ever known. I don't know about that, but thank you, but... I mean, if I asked you right now to tell us about the French Revolution, you could probably name families that were involved. I, I have a lot of knowledge about a lot of useless information <laughs> crammed in my head. So um, I don't know why I, where I got that from. I just read a lot when I was a kid. I had a world book encyclopedias in my room, and I just read them. I mean, we were, we were at Bandon not long ago, and you started telling me about the Cuban Revolution. And you knew details. It was probably an hour-long description, but you knew details that I don't think books even have. I got that one. <laughs> Full disclosure, I have a friend whose great grandfather was a president of Cuba. His last name was Menacal. And so we've talked about it a lot. And uh, it kind of stuck. But because, because of him, yeah. I, ga- I gained some interest on it and, and read on it. His, his mother and uh, father like ran from Cuba when, when, uh, when it fell, when um, Batista was overthrown by Castro. So they have some, they're an interesting family to yeah. talk to. And they, first hand. First hand. And they have um, uh, some um, interesting stories simply because they went from, you know, the the wealthy part of society in Cuba to come in yeah. to, they went to Mexico City and then came to the United States and started um, all over again. And then they're successful again. Yeah. Like, they, yeah. you know, they, they found a way, figured it out. So anyway, that's, that's, I kind of had a help on, on knowing that little bit of information. Well, what about the French Revolution, the Spanish Revolution, the American Revolution? I, I read a lot of that stuff. I like it. I think uh, I think we have to know our history to um, not to repeat the mistakes. Not, well, we're, we're on our way, but uh, yeah. but it's um, you have to know and you have to be informed and educated and and really from all kind of different angles because you have to you know the same story can be told different ways by five people and you'll get a different perspective. So it's important to kind of uh, pull common facts that you know and, and that carry through and then, and then make your opinions based on the facts. It's hard to, uh, you can, do get passionate and you get yeah. emotion because you, you care about um, where things are going and how they're, how they're going to pan out. But um, still, when it comes to making informed opinions, you got to have the facts and the knowledge and, and then just apply logic and, and let it take you where it goes. So t- talk to us about your early reading. Like how did you become a reader at such an early age? Like I said, when I was, at, <laughs> we had a, we had the, the encyclopedias, just like every kid growing up in the in the seventies and yeah. early eighties. You had like, World Book and Britannica, yeah. and yeah. my grandma always bought those for us and stuck them in the room. You just and read them. I can remember I read the World War Two section of of the nineteen seventy four. So how World old Book were you? Of, I was I was probably eight, seven. Reading the World yeah, War I had II. a light on my bed, and. uh I'd get in trouble because as soon as they leave, I'd turn the light on and read. And it was always history. Like I did, it was just once again, it was, Mm -hmm. I didn't, I wasn't like some science, even though I've become a doctor, I wasn't reading like theories. I was reading like just history and story. I like stories and history are true stories, right? Right. And and if it's told well, then you kind of, it sinks in. Yeah. Yeah, You you can like relate, you know, then you, and at that time, you know, all my grandfather, I have, I have a step grandfather and and two biological grandmas. All of them really? were in the war. Anyway, in the oh, war, wow. so so like I could, one of them fought at Iwo Jima, and then another one was uh, my grandfather 
on my dad's side was um, was in the Philippines when when in Luzon mm. and when it fell, and so it just kind of had all, all all that information. Well, it's the same thing with the Cuban deal is that you had somebody first person. Yeah, and you get interested, and you read it, and yeah. you see the characters, and, and the, the one who I talked to the most was my grandfather, my, my step grandfather from uh, my, my grandmother's second marriage, and he he lost a hand. And his other thumb went a, went a mortar around landed in his Higgins boat. So it's like real, it's real, real. Well, it's real. real. Like, and, yeah. and you know, he he didn't talk to many people about it, but since he knew I was really interested, he would, mm-hmm. he would tell. He took a a stack of pills that now I know was all antipsychotics. And he was <laughs> he was definitely disturbed by by whatever his experience was. But that generation didn't talk about any of that. They right. just sucked it up and moved on. You right. Know? Well, and so what do you see with all the history that you've read about, learned, watched? We've heard that cycle of like, uh, you know, hard times make strong men, strong men make uh, great times, great times make weak men and weak men make hard times. Um, do you see that cycle throughout history as you read? Yeah, you can. Uh, I mean, once again, I just try to read it and then apply it to what I'm living. Right. And so, um, yeah, I could see our country doing that. You're losing. You know, there's also another there's a 10 stages of a country. You've probably come across yeah. it. I forget them. All, it's, but, it's the, the but it's Scottish like, guy. It's the demise of uh, democracy. Well, it's it's how all democracies, all fail. great democracies start and then yeah. fail. Apathy is the last apathy, stage. Apathy, yeah. apathy, well, apathy or no totalitarianism is the last one, because after apathy, you like then, so, then some. Yeah. Well, something bad's happening. And, Maybe like your borders getting overrun, or you, you, there's too much crime, and then you're like, the, and that was the, bon, that was Bonaparte, that was all of them. Like, just bring, just give me some order. Like, yeah. I can't have this chaos anymore. And that's when you get a totalitarian. This, you know. Well, that's where you know one of my favorite authors. And I think I've either shared the book with you or have you read it, is Jordan Peterson. He talks yeah. about every decision we make, it will tilt the axis of your world and the world around you either towards order or towards chaos. Right. And if you do that on a massive scale the chaos will end up in totalitarianism, right? It has to, because you can't, people can't function in chaos. Right. You can't, there's no services, no goods, no no normal sense of what we think of as society. Even even fractured societies can exist in a chaotic state. It mm-hmm. won't happen. And the, I've, I've been on a Michael Schellenberger kick, and he's a phenomenal author. Very smart guy, well-researched, and kind of politically opposite of me. But when I read the book, He's, well, he's well, he's moved my way, and I moved yeah. his way, you yeah. know. And so it's like you, uh, you see that you know logic prevails does prevail at the end of the day. And I've always been uber logic and not too much emotion, even though. Uh, and and the other side's all emotion and their logic. And he's got some great. Seems like solutions for homelessness in California. I just finished San Francisco. It's yeah. uh, it was a phenomenal book. Kind of slow in the beginning because it's a lot of statistics and stuff. But then when he starts getting to the application of theories and and what he sees as solutions, because the the solutions are already there, right? Yeah. It's a whole. He has a great and once again he pulled it from somewhere. And I'm not the best. I'm, I'm kind of like a big picture reader. I, yeah, remember, yeah. I can't remember specific points, but I remember the idea of the book and. The, one of his things was like the there's six ways you frame a thought process or or how you feel or think about something. And it's like do you do you like order so authority? Do you like um, sanctity? You know the, the, the moral compass of it, compassion. Uh, and there's six of them. But the, but his whole point was compassion and equality are things that the the the, Cal, the San Francisco people value far more than authority. And sanctity. So, what happens is because you want to be compassionate, and you and you and you want to be equal, you give in on all the things where you should stand that stand, put your foot down, and say, "Well, that's great, but are we really help? Are we really being compassionate? And are we really really providing equality by just letting these people shoot up drugs in an open air market and, and destroy the whole?" other half of the equation right. which was the sanctity and authority there's no respect for authority there's no sanctity of of the behavior and so his his theories on fixing homelessness were really already done in Amps- if you read the book you know in Amsterdam they started no you, you don't you get do a free that. house you, you you have to if you want to live in the free house then you have to not do drugs and if you want to you know if you want to get the handout then you have to get a job when it can and be a balance of authority and what's the whole point yeah. and that's and that's it to come you know and and there's the the leading the ruling class at least is his theories the ruling class in in san francisco and a lot of the west coast you know more more liberal states is that well we just do we just do compassion, compassion. we just do compassion and that's it 
And so yeah, you're pseudo short term compassion. Oh yeah, because they get fed up with it too. Yeah. I mean they uh he they have talk- gates around they have fences around their house. Well yeah, they're not living in that area. Yeah. They just like you go over there and do that. Right. You know? So um No Schellenberg is brilliant. He's brilliant. And I, I've I've loved reading his stuff. So I've read two of his books, um, and I'm download downloaded another one, and mm-hmm. I'm, I kind of I just click it. If it's I don't even know the name of it. If I see he's an author, his, I just I just do download it. it. Yep. He's he's up there. Um, what else are you reading? Uh, I just started um, the Thomas Sowell uh, Facts and Fallacies. Mm. It's just an economics theory book because yeah. I think he's great. He's brilliant. Mm-hmm. Uh, he wrote uh, Wealth, Poverty, and Politics. It's like four inches thick. It's it's amazing. Uh-huh. Basic economics is amazing. Um, what I take away from basic economics, and I apply this to my family, but also to society, economics is all scarcity and allocation of resources. Right. And uh, people don't really think it's just always going to be there. Well, that's the, once again, it's the fallacy that um, you just wake up and the, the gas is at the station and the food's in the store, yeah. but you're not participating in the acquisition or presentation of any of those things for delivery to the customer you're sure. a consumer and it's okay to be a consumer but you have to respect that there's other people working to get it mm-hmm. to you and and it's is the, the assumption that everything works just fine without order and sanctity right. or authority um is absurd and you can see it you can see it happening when when we, we just abdicate what is common sense and, and logic and, and logic you, you it falls apart mm-hmm. you still it's everything's being held together by f- fewer and fewer logical hard-working people because they want i'm out mm-hmm. i don't want to live in a you know broken society so i'm gonna keep i'm well, gonna keep plugging away and do i want to vouch do. for <laughs> your uh compassion and order because i'll never forget when i was going to residency we did the same residency year year ahead of me and i called you and i didn't know you that well although we went to the same undergrad same med school you were a year ahead of me and I said, hey, I'm, I'm coming to for there for a month. And you go, you're staying with me. <laughs> I remember and, that. Dude, you treated me like I was a family member. Well, I'm a compassionate guy. I just don't suffer fools. And so I don't, yeah. I don't, um, when people have, and my kids, my kids will tell you this, they'll, <laughs> sometimes I'm too hard, but don't give me a story that's not true Real. like don't don't Real. give me this oh the teacher's mean or the yeah. you know or i had a bad day or i got a headache it's like nobody cares like right nobody cares the world keeps spinning yep. you have you are responsible for you um and you make your own luck and people help each other because they want to help you right. if, if you're if you're dependent on somebody helping you and you're just standing there hoping they come help you well, that's not going to happen. Not gonna happen. No, usually you get help when, you, when you're on side of the road and you got a flat tire and you're trying to struggle with the jack and you and you're spinning the you know the tire wrench, the tire iron, and then some dude says, "Man, I'm stopping to help that guy." But yeah. if you just sat there and just stared at the wall, right, not trying anything, nothing's going to happen. You probably going to come help. Well, you. just to let you know too. I think um, compassion breeds compassion, and success breeds success. Right. Um, because the year, the next year, I matched there as you know, we worked together, but. There was two more LSU students that wanted to come, and they said, "Hey, we're coming to town." And guess what I did? It's paid it forward. Yeah, I said, "Y'all are staying with me," and they stayed with me at the same time. Well, and we did. We had a good run of LSU we guys did. at that program for a while. So, we did. Um, and then LSU won the national championship while we they, were there. They did. And I remember there was a guy. when well, you know Kevin, Kevin Smith, who was one of my closest friends there, and he was a year behind you, if I remember. It, That's great. You start forgetting the years, so right. uh, as you get further away, but. Uh, and I had tickets to that game, and I was convinced, just because I'm a typical LSU fan, that we were going to fail right at the end and lose. <laughs> and Kevin wanted to go, and he was a, he played golf at Oklahoma, so he's a huge Oklahoma fan. I'm like, man, we got a like conference in the morning, and we, we could have skipped it, yeah. right? And I made a hundred excuses not to go to that game, and then of course we won, yeah. and we smashed him. And uh, and he's like, and I was like, yeah, we got you, dude. You don't make any excuses. I know you thought you were going to lose. That's why you <laughs> dropped in the game. Was we could have stayed? I was doing our rotation in Houston, and I got tickets last uh-huh. minute, so I went. Yeah, I had them. I didn't yeah. go. Yeah. My, my, my if dad, you had gone, it'd been another way. Oh yeah, I lost. I, I'd have jinxed them. I'm always. That's I'm a guy who like. I'm not. Did gonna you go lie. to the Alabama one where we didn't get? Past I did. Uh, <laughs> See? I, but then and then I didn't want to go to uh, the Clemson one. Yeah. But I'm like, I dressed up. I dressed up in a crazy, I wish I had a picture I could show you, you'd cry laughing, it was hilarious. Trey Maurice and I dressed up in zoot suits. I had like this big yellow suit, and my wife, who's a, who can, who's a great seamstress and, and also an artist, and she just stitched all kind of stuff on this. It, it was hilarious. It, I mean, I still have it in my, 
in my closet in case awesome. I have the Hands opportunity again. to use it again. Yep. Yep. We got to see that one. I have it. So the other thing I remember is, and, and you and I, we're probably on a tech strand daily for the last 12 years or so. Of random people. Random people. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, it's undiscoverable for any of those that are listening. Yeah, yeah. I don't know what are you talking about. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but I'll never forget, even though that, we don't see each other a whole lot. We share books, share right, ideas, right. share patience. Um, but I'll never forget, I saw you in a restaurant one day. And this was when I was in my midlife crisis of business school in, at Yale. And you go, what you been up to? And I said, uh, I just got to go to business school. He said, where? I said, Yale. And you go, I want in. <laughs> and yeah, people will say that, but there's a hundred things you got to do to do it. And sure enough, dude, you did it. Like you, like I'm all in. And then you and next thing I know, you and I are flying up there together back and forth. Yeah, I, I, I was, once again, it's one of those things where it was, you know, preparation and opportunity. You know, luck, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. And so I, um, I had looked to do there was a there was a there was a full MBA program that Penn offered, and I had looked at that six years before, seven years before, and I was going to do it. And my wife up and got pregnant with my last kid. Did you find so, the guy? <laughs> I got him. Yeah, <laughs> he's still paying. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, um, and so I always wanted to do it, and then that they had canceled that program, mm. and, and it was just a short lived thing. Um, and so when you said you, you were in I'm like what I didn't want to do is have to go through a whole bunch of hocus pocus to get in which yeah. there was more hocus pocus with the Yale one than the pen because pen was as long as you could pay the fee and you were yeah. a doctor they would take you uh, but I but I got in uh, um, and su subjected myself to another uh, two more years of school which not doing another one <laughs> not getting no a more. law degree no. done, done. Uh, uh, I actually I have a friend up here who who's um who's ill and I was visiting him today and I was telling him, yeah, I, uh, when I did that MBA, we're talking about, it. it's like, why'd you do that? And I said, I, I wanted to, there's a business thing I wanted to accomplish. And I said about two weeks in when I was making all A's and everything and doing really well, I'm like, dude, what have I subjected myself <laughs> to again? And my grades fell off yeah. precipitously and, uh, ended up passing it obviously and getting yeah. a degree, but it was, um, some of that stuff was time consuming yeah. and, uh, and, you know, oddly enough, and because our world is orthopedic surgery, uh, and w I still keep in touch with him. He broke his hip recently, and is, is art, uh, our professor oh, art. Yeah, art. <laughs> I mean, anybody that can take statistics and make it interesting, but he did it, and he was a legend. And that's one of the reasons I wanted to do it in person is because I want to have relationships with the people I'm learning from. Totally agree. I, I was not doing it online. Yeah. No chance. Not only that, but like I had colleagues coming from Brazil, China, Oh, and oh, we yeah. still keep in touch, you know. It's I have a broadened. couple. I have a couple businesses I've, I'm involved in with with guys from that yeah. from that class. So um, I think that your education, as a matter of fact, all the schooling I've done, with the exception of med school, you had better been getting relationships yeah. because the value is what you which you extract after the school. That's right. And you know the school is about knowing learning your character knowing if you're smart enough or if you're the kind of guy you want to do business with, particularly business school. Uh, and I have probably, I would say, six or seven people that I stay in touch with all the time and are either doing stuff with them or attempting to do stuff with right. them but because because of the, you learn the character of the individual, you know, and some people, you know, they may be great businessmen, but they don't they don't work well with you, right? right? And so you find the guys or the, or, the, or the people that work well with you and then you roll from there, you know. So... You know, you, you live in New Orleans, but you practice in Homa. And uh, you and I both do a lot of hunting and fishing and stuff like that. You got to tell them, without using patient names, two of the greatest patient stories I've ever heard. And two the, of them, and they both ended up with you at the end. Yeah, I, the two I got involved in. Now, one, I saved them. You saved you know, you them. Had, you just had to follow them because yeah. they were both from Baton Rouge. I want that to be clear. But the clavicle and the, the, the catfish. Yeah. The, it, well, so I'll start with the climate one. I was I was hunting with a friend of mine. You were on call. I was on call. And but you gotta understand it's different in Homa. Like I'm hunting and I can be back in the hospital in fifteen minutes, twenty minutes from the from the duck blind. So right. I was with a friend of mine, we're at his place in his mud boat and we come cruising out. We had killed our limit and we're cruising out the out out the pass. We go out of the 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 channel in his lease into the main the main run of water. And, uh, and there's a dude just waving at us and he's not, he's only about 150 yards away. And it's one of those big, um, aluminum hull, 
um, work boats, but it works inside. So it's got like bumpers in the front and center console and two engines in the back. And then there's a there's a mud boat like I was tied up to the side of it. So we pull up to us and they wave at us like, look, man, this guy's hurt. And I jump on the boat. And the guy, the guy from Baton Rouge, I honestly forgot his name, was <laughs> he was he came out not paying attention. And this dude is just flying i mean the the aluminum hull boat's going 30 and he hits him and ejects the dude riding in the front of the mud boat out into the center console boat and he strikes his shoulder against the the aluminum angle iron on the center console and his whole clavels was sticking out of his shoulder and he's like oh this hurt i think i've really messed myself up like i check his pulse and he's all he's all fine it's closed through the skin or no oh it was open it was sticking through and i'm like you know, it's not bleeding bad, so it's nothing nothing too bad. And I know I can handle it. I said, well, Today's your it's lucky your day. unlucky, lucky day. <laughs> he goes, why is that? And I was like, because I'm the orthopedic surgeon on call, so I'm the dude that's handling this, and I'm going to the hospital around. So I put the guy in my truck from the from the boat ramp, put him in my truck, <laughs> drove him straight to the OR, checked him in, and operated him. He was, he was fixed. How long after you saw him was he fixed? Two hours. <laughs> That's crazy. Back, lined up, fixed, and I and he's like, "Can I go home?" I'm like, "Sure, you can go home." And I said, "He goes, you know, I follow up with it." And I gave him your name, and I said, "Tell him the story. He'll love it." <laughs> and then the other one. Today's your unlucky lucky day. That says your unlucky lucky day. And he, I mean, he was like, "You can't. You got to write an article about that guy. That's I mean, you got you to talk about the care you got in Homa." Yeah. And then um, there was uh, another guy who was fishing. He was from Baton Rouge, and uh, he, this is actually I think this one's even funnier, but just because it's. Not smart, but I'm not giving names, so you know. Or professions. I'm hip, I'm hip, I'm or hip, professions. No, I know. I, I don't remember what he does. <laughs> but he he was fishing, and uh, he had a uh, he was fishing with shrimp, and he got in the catfish. He wasn't catching trout; he was catching catfish, and he got mad at catching the catfish. So instead of just flipping the catfish off and smashing him, he grabbed his pistol. And, the, and he's trying to shoot the catfish while he's holding the line and it's swinging. And he shoots, and he shoots right through his wrist. Missed everything in play. Oh, he didn't touch the catfish. He no, oh. but he also missed his arteries. Oh, he, he didn't. Yeah, he didn't have neurovascular structure, but he blew up his distal radius yeah. like in a gazillion pieces. Yeah. And he rolled into uh, the hospital, and I put him back together. And he's like, "I'm from Baton Rouge." I said, "Well, uh, I have a guy you can he follow up with." Tell him the great. story. <laughs> And so I said, make sure you tell him the story because he's going to love it. So <laughs> Anytime time I get a patient from Dr. Brett Casey and they say, I got a story to tell you, I'm like, I can't wait for this one. I have some interesting ones. So, yeah. But I'm sure we all do. You know, it's just kind of how it goes with our profession. Well, but the hour one way is probably a good way to get in a lot of books. Well, that's so we moved back to New Orleans. I have an autistic child, as you're well aware. And so um, we in the, the journey to educate him and, and give him the best. We ended up in New Orleans um, and. Then the other kids started school there, so we just decided to commit to it and uh, and let them finish. So it was easier for me to drive than everybody else drives. Mm-hmm. So um, I love Homa. It's kind of even though I'm from New Orleans, live in New Orleans, it's where I consider my home simply because I've made a great career there, and mm-hmm. I, I love the people. Community. Oh, the community is great. I mean, it's no better place, in my opinion, to practice medicine. I, I, the people are, you know, it's like like probably medicine was 40 years ago. Yeah. Still, you know. Um, let we have less, uh, you know, corporate. We still have corporate stuff, but not like the Everywhere big cities have yeah. become. And so um, it's fun. You, you you have your own stuff, and and so yeah, the book thing started because um, I know I, we pass books back and forth oh, like every yeah. other week. And I started when when before you could even Bluetooth it to your car. I had an iPad, and yeah. I would download the iPad, link it to a speaker, <laughs> and play it. And it was, and I did all the Game of Thrones books, which. I mean, I would have to like, because you kind of zone out, yeah. and then like there's like four trillion characters in there, so you'd have to like, I'd like, give me back. So the books are like 25, 30 hours each, and yeah. I probably took 100 hours to read each one because I got to back up and, <laughs> and keep trying to figure out. On the iPad link to the... <laughs> yeah, hey. What are you reading now? I, I said... Uh, I, I Schellenberger? Did, I did the finished San Francisco, and now I'm reading um, the, the Thomas Sowell, just uh, Facts yeah. and Fallacies. Yeah. Uh, and that, I just started. I literally started. That's a that. thick. That's a thick read. Yeah, yeah it's it's on a, it's on an audio book, so I don't know. I think. No, but like is. sometimes <laughs> on those, I gotta digest. Oh, I ha- it's a lot of it's a lot of uh, like every word's important. Yeah. Right. So you can't zone out. I actually, he's on something about transportation and why mass transportation only works in New York, and it's a very 
you know, people try to take that and just apply it there. Well, mass transportation doesn't work in New Orleans. No. It's not going to, it's I not going to work in. You know, what's you know, incredible Louis. is you take guys like Thomas Sowell or Michael Schellenberger and what's in their brains that gets put into print or audio is available to all of us. Right. And we could learn and apply that. We're trying, but we're also, most of society is more interested in pleasure than education and betterment. Would well, you say? yes. And that's the, a big part. I look, I, I'm, you know, me, I'm yeah. love golf. I play golf right. as much as I can play. Uh, but scratch, right? Yes. Well, I had my shoulder, I had to rotate a cuff repair, you know, a couple months ago. So I'm not scratch anymore, but yeah, you know, I can, I'm hoping to get it back and my son's getting into it. So it's going to force me to even go practice more because he's, he's starting to like it. Uh, but I will say that, you know, economics is freedom, whether we like it or not, mm -hmm. it is. And so, um, if you abdicate your duty to learn how the system works and what's happening around you, you know, and most people have, and it's, it's just a fact because they get, you know, they're going, I'm, I'm an Instagram fool. I, I watch that all the time. I got, and every once in a while I'll kick myself and say, dude, you got to stop. Go learn something. You're not, you're wasting time. This yeah. is total uselessness. Go hit golf balls, right? It's even mm -hmm. better time than, than that. Uh, people are wondering what's happening to them or why. I mean, look at the, the currency situation right now. I mean, they're, they've doubled the money supply in four years. Hmm. What's going to happen? You're going to have inflation. It doesn't matter. It's, you can't not. You, for, it's going to happen. And people are like, well, we need to we never lowering prices. It's not coming down. No. They're not coming down. No. So, so you have to understand what's Raising happening. Raising wages won't help. Well, I mean, no, because that just chase more inflation. Yeah. So, so it's, you have to be aware of the of the macroeconomic things and just a couple of them. It's not too complicated, but you have to be aware of what's happening and how it affects you because we do vote. And if you start, they don't want to, at least a lot of the politicians don't want an educated populace in that kind of way because then you could really make informed decisions and you and things would matter more as opposed to promises that most people Well, and the ignorant, ignorant are more persuadable. Yeah. Well, because they believe whatever's told. What is said, right. Exactly. Um, so let's get back to golf right quick, and then we're going to probably land the plane here soon. How did you get started with a passion for golf? And what what I'm really interested in, because you and I can talk philosophy, politics, religion, medicine while we're golfing, and yet your passion for excellence in golf, which is unattainable to be perfect, right, um, is a unending. lot of people better than me at it, you know. But uh, I fell in love with golf when I was very when well, I say very young, when I was 15, and I. I grabbed my buddy's club and he brought me out. Uh, well, my dad, I started hitting balls with my dad younger, but he, he didn't play very much. Uh, he liked it, but he was just so busy working. Uh, then he didn't play much, but I had, I had his clubs and I hit balls with, with him. And then I went out to, with a buddy to the golf course and I hit it and I could hit it hard. I could always hit it pretty hard. I was a terrible putter when I was younger, but I could hit it hard. And he goes, man, if you could straighten that out, you could, you could really get good at this game. Yeah. And, I said, okay, and he played. So I was yeah. like, all right. So I just started working on it. And the better I got, I did I did get good enough to start really enjoying it and competing. And, and, yeah, competing and accomplishing things and doing things that, you know, you know, you, you want to break a hundred, then you mm -hmm. want to break ninety, then you want to break eighty, then you know, you want to break Super. seventy, and then getting to break seventy is, you know, a lot of work. And but, you know, the rewards from you know, because it's a four-hour game that mm -hmm. you have to, you can't fall asleep, and everybody falls asleep. You know, you mm -hmm. kind of start daydreaming, you make a bad shot, and it's hard to recover. So so it takes a lot of um, just concentration, focus, particularly when you're competing, you know. Mm -hmm. And when we go on a trip, so, uh, you know, I start talking, and I'll screw up. <laughs> I'll, you know, I hit a bad one, and it's just kind of like, you know, just testament to, to the competitive nature of the game. I like, I've always liked sports. I've always liked competing. And it's it's a game that you can do well into your 80s, mm -hmm. you know, if you're fortunate enough to live that long and 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 still play it. You know, yep. it's it's uh, it's not it's not something. You know, it's, my son loves baseball and he's finally starting to love golf. And I have three sons, but the youngest one is is the one that's really absorbed with athletics. And he's like, I'm like, look, you can do all the other ones, but at least let me teach you golf at a young age Lifelong. where you can, because you can do it till you die. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he's just caught the bug. Like he's going Good. like the last two weeks. It's hilarious. He's just going every day and now he's hitting it. And he's yeah. like, Oh, I could see improvement. See I said, well, you just, you, it's just commitment of time. Yep. You got to dig it out the dirt. Distance you know, you gotta, is right. Time's time. That's right. Last question. Two part. 
What would you tell a 20 year old version of yourself? And what's the next chapter for Dr. Brett Casey? Um, the 20 year version of me, I would say, get a little bit better grades. If you want to go to med school, you'll save two <laughs> years. Um, cause I had a little delay getting in, but I did really well in med school. But no, I think, um, I would say what, what a lot of people say, first of all, uh, on the economics, save money early and let it compound. That's yep. the simplest thing you can do. Great to mention all time. It's, right? it's, it is. I mean, you're going to either get compound interest or you're going to pay compound interest. One be two. one of the guys that get it. And that's just a simple, I can start at yep. a young and don't touch it. Like just have some, cause I didn't do that. And yeah. I, I've, you know, Rode the roller coaster. Yeah. Uh, the other thing I would say is uh, is be a little bit more committed to your goals. Focus on uh, on what you're trying to accomplish. I, and I was very goal committed, but it could have even been more. You know, yeah. like you know, don't waste so much time doing this that. And then also, you know, I never been to Europe. I did any traveling. I still haven't. Yeah. And I would have. I would tell myself do a couple of these things that as you get older, you're going to have some constraint in your life sure. that prevents you from doing it. And so, you know. Go ahead and and do those things now when you got a little a little free time or mm -hmm. you know we always think we have so much responsibilities but as you and I know and every adult knows is you get the well, older you get, you get when you get kids you get a house note you get a job you you get responsibilities that you're like man yeah. you know the the German two test on Wednesday yeah. in, in 1990 wasn't that big a deal right, you know right. so anyway. and then where do you see yourself what's the next chapter for you. I think I'll always be practicing some sort of medicine. I'd like to slow down at some point in time. I don't see it in the near future, but at some point in time. But I, I want to stay involved in that. I think I have a gift for it, and I've been, I, I enjoy it. And, you know, we had great training. Right. So, um, you know, I feel like I can handle a lot of stuff with that. Um, I'd like to do uh, some other business ventures that we're starting on right now. I'd really like to build a company and sell it. Mm -hmm. And uh that's going to have to be in the healthcare space simply because that's what I know. Yeah. I always think I've lost enough money trying to do, do other things. 25 things that I don't know anything about. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, at 53, healthcare. I finally learned that I have to stay, stay in, in your lane. lane. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, how can people find you if they want to be, if you want to be found Instagram, uh, Instagram, I have a, a page there. Uh, and then obviously through my orthopedic practice, um, we, we, uh, Gulf coast orthopedic staff at home. We have, uh, we have a web page, and then I have my own web page, and, and you just Google my name. It's, yep. it's right there. Well, look, you've always been a friend and a mentor, and I appreciate you, and thanks for being on Under the Knife. No, I, lo I love hanging with you, and it's a, it's a pleasure to talk. Hopefully, but, I'll get to come back. Let's keep doing life. Yep. God bless. Thank you for joining us today, and a big thank you to all of our listeners for tuning in to this surgical exploration of politics, health care, and life. I've been your host. Dr. Craig Green. Remember to stay informed, stay sharp, and join us next time to see which of life's topics we'll dissect under the knife.